Hello, my name is Karen Chin and I am delighted to be part of this Polar Dino Fest event. And of course I'd like to thank the good folks at the Utah Natural History Museum for inviting me to participate. Today I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the research we've done on a Cretaceous environment in the, from the high Canadian Arctic. But before we get started, I'd first like to acknowledge that many people have contributed to this research and this project. And we are particularly grateful for support from the National Science Foundation, the Polar Continental Shelf Project, and the Nunavik government. Well, because the Cretaceous was a greenhouse world, when we try to conjure up what that world was like, we can envision habitats in tropical areas, either terrestrial habitats or marine habitats. But we have no modern analog for polar environments in a greenhouse environment because all of the areas that we know of today are very cold. And we know that cold environments would certainly affect ancient um, organisms. It can, they can affect them in several ways. If you're in a marine environment, you can have development of persistent sea ice. In terrestrial habitats, you can have suppression of plant heights. So you have tundra instead of taller vegetation. And certainly cold environments really slows down growth and decomposition. So if we try to reconstruct what was happening in an ancient greenhouse world, we can ask two main questions, or at least two main questions that we're going to ask today. And that is, how were Cretaceous Arctic marine ecosystems different from the Arctic ecosystems of today? And also, how much warmer were those ancient Arctic ecosystems? Now, I have not always been thinking a lot about Arctic ecosystems. It wasn't until my colleague, Dr. Jalen Eberly, shared with me that she and a colleague had found many different coprolites in a site that they visited up in the high Canadian Arctic. Now she told me this information because I do study ancient coprolites or fossilized species, and it's not everybody who studies those. It might seem like an odd thing to study, but you can tell quite a bit of things from studying well-preserved uh, fossil feces specimens. You can tell some things about trophic interactions or who ate whom in the past. We can also learn about how nutrients and carbon resources were recycled in ancient environments. And sometimes well-preserved specimens can tell you a lot or tell you something about ancient paleo environments. So I was very excited when Dr. Eberly told me about that she had found so many different coprolites. So we got together with a colleague and we wrote a proposal to NSF to go up and investigate the site more. We were delighted when this project was funded and we went up to the site, which is up in Devon Island, on Devon Island, which is currently at about 76 degrees north latitude. Back in the Cretaceous, there was some adjustments, some movements of the continents. It wasn't the exact same uh, distribution of continents we have today, but People have looked at reconstructions or have developed reconstructions and they figure out, have figured out that back in the Cretaceous, the latitude of this site was within 10 degrees of what it is today. So it was still above the Arctic Circle. Now you can see from this map that the site is way up there on Devon Island, which is an uninhabited uh, island today. So there were considerable logistical challenges to get up there and do research at that site. So because of this, we were grateful to utilize the support system of the Polar Continental Project. And they support research in Arctic areas in Canada. 
Now in this picture you can see on the left is doc Dr. John Block, who was our sedimentologist, Dr. Jalen Eberly, who studies usually fossil mammals, me and Dr. Stephen Kumba, who studies fossil fish. This was the first expedition that I've been involved with, where you have to use uh, planes and helicopters to get to your field site. But it was very exciting, and after um, quite a bit of planning, the field crews from the Polar Continental Shelf Project deposited in a beautiful site, field site, on Devon Island. But what we were there to study were, were the rocks and the fossils, and they were both beautiful. Um, in this scene, you can see that the, the, the scenery almost looks like it's emerald in color. And those are true colors because the Cretaceous sediments that we were visiting were actually um, mostly green sands. And this deposit was actually in the Cretaceous sediments that were deposited in a down-dropped graben. So we were looking at younger sediments, uh, Cretaceous sediments, even though most of the area around us were older Paleozoic sediments. The formation that we looked at was the Kangak Formation, mostly the Kangak Formation, that was roughly about 92 um, to about 73 million years old. We had a little bit of uh, terrestrial um, sediments on the top, but mostly we were looking at a, a conformable stratigraphic succession of about 200 meters with a lot of mudstones, distal mudstones or offshore mudstones at the base, then green sand and just a little bit of terrestrial sediment on top. Now, Dr. Everly had promised me that she had found lots of coprolites, and she delivered on her pro promise. There were so many coprolites of all different sizes, shapes, and colors. I, co I collected about 400 different specimens, and there are thousands still remaining at the site. In, in fact, there were some places they were so thick that it was difficult for you to take a step without stepping on a, a broken piece of coprolite, such as you see in this photo here. There were also invertebrate fossils. For example, we, on the left you can see we, we found a new genus of a, a glass hexactinellid sponge. We had pieces of, found pieces of lobsters and brachiopod, um, lingulid brachiopods and squid parts. We would probably expect to see a lot of clams in a marine environment like this, but there was a taphonomic bias against preserving uh, calcium carbonate. So we did see some clams, but they were mostly preserved in, in coprolites, within coprolites, or we could see impressions of them in sediment. In terms of vertebrates, we probably collected, we collected every piece of vertebrate we could find, and we found, we collected about 80 to 90 um, teeth, mostly from fish, cartilaginous and bony fish, but also some from marine reptiles. And we also had found postcranial material from uh, plesiosaurs and fish and flightless Hesperniform birds. We found no uh, organ or no animals, no terrestrial animals at this site, but we did find sizable pieces of wood that were either in the terrestrial environments or they were in the marine, had washed into the marine sediments. And this is actually important because this indicated that back in the Cretaceous, the environment supported taller trees and not simply short tundra plants. And in fact, it was these pieces of wood were even more interesting because some of them had these borings inside that were produced by 
shipworms or Torito clams that actually bore into wood and take, an advantage, take advantage of the wood resources. Now, if you're trying to understand an ancient ecosystem, you want to usually look for who were the primary producers, in other words, the photosyn photosynthesizers in an environment like this. And in marine environments, usually we consider that most of the photosynthesizers are phytoplankton. So the question is, would we see phytoplankton in an environment like this? The answer is yes. When we examine the sediments, there were zillions of siliceous microfossils, mostly diatoms. But not only diatoms, as you see in the upper part of this slide, but we also found lots of dinoflagellates, about 100 different taxa, taxa of diatoms, about 70 taxa of dinoflagellates, which are marine, another four, type of marine plankton. And we also found terrestrial pollen and spores that had washed out from the, uh, the land as well. Finding all these different organisms, we could begin to build a list of the organisms, some of the organisms that lived in that, that Cretaceous Devon Island environment. We had the plankton, the microscopic plankton, we had invertebrates that, that colonized the seafloor, and we had the, the or, or invertebrates that colonized the seafloor, and the vertebrates that took advantage of the water column. We didn't just want to only focus on building a list of the organisms that lived there. It's much more exciting if you can try to figure out how different organisms interacted in an ancient environment. And because we had found the coprolites, we had some clues about what was happening. I mentioned that I collected about 400 different specimens, and that's saying a lot. Coprolites were the most common macrofossils that we found at the site. But we could generally say that there were two major types. There were green coprolites that were green because they contained, contained a lot of green sand. And then there were phosphatic coprolites, coprolites that contained high percentages of calcium phosphate. Now, when we analyzed the green sand coprolites by making thin sections, you could see inside, yes, there was a lot of green sand, but there were also um, invertebrates in there. At the top of this photo, you can see pieces of, of lobster exoskeleton. And when we made thin sections of the phosphatic coprolite, <laughs> that was a real surprise because these are filled with, again, millions, zillions of, of microscopic um, plankton, mostly uh, diatoms in this case. The, the, the phosphatic coprolites were also interesting because they were tremendously burrowed um, and they were associated with fecal pellets as well. So this told us that there were organisms that were living on the seafloor or around the seafloor or below the seafloor that saw these species as food. So you can imagine when some organisms defecated into the water column and it landed near these benthic invertebrates, they must have thought, aha, manna from heaven, because that was great. Those were great resources, judging from how burrowed the coprolites were. Looking at these coprolites, we could recognize about several different uh, feeding strategies that, that tell us about how the, the Devon Island ecosystem, the structure of the De Devon Island ecosystem. If we looked at the green sand coprolites, we know that those coprolite or those organisms that produce those species were benthic feeders because they ingested a lot of sand while they were probably looking for organisms like worms and other things that were in the bottom sediments of the ocean. In contrast, the phosphatic coprolites that contained a lot of 
uh, planktonic fossils indicated animals that were feeding in the water column on plankton or planktivores, soft-bodied planktivores. So we have both pelagic and benthic feeders that were living at this site. But we say that these, these represent short food chains because we don't have large animals feeding on smaller and smaller and smaller, lots of organisms in a food chain. We have sizable organisms feeding on very tiny organisms. The other pattern of feeding we noticed is the fact that there was a fair amount of coprophagy or um, fe feces eating from the benthic, some benthic invertebrates. And because these organisms were feeding on the coprolites that re represented pelagic feeding, this indicates what we call benthic or pelagic benthic coupling, where you're coupling the resources from the water column with resources in the sea floor. Now another aspect of the ecosystem that we wanted to think about was the fact that both in the coprolites and in the sediment there were so many diatoms and other planktonic fossils that this really indicated a highly productive marine environment. And to have such a productive marine environment, you have to have a good source of nutrients, particularly nitrogen and phosphorus, to support that high productivity. So we, we asked, where might those, those nutrients have come from? And we decided that there were three possible possibilities. Um, in modern environments, when you have melting sea ice, they, the, the ice flows when they melt release a lot of nutrients from the organisms living inside. So that was one possibility. We could also consider deep ocean upwelling that often brings up nutrients from very deep water. And we could also consider input from the land or what we call it terrigenous input. Well, of course we can rule out the melting sea ice and people who have done tectonic reconstructions of the Arctic have noted that there are no, there were no areas in the Cretaceous that seem to have really deep water basins. So we have to rule out the deep water as well. So the most likely source of nutrients for this ancient ecosystem appears to have come from the land. And we do have several lines of evidence for this. Um, one line is, is from the shipworm burrow borings that I already told you about. Um, we also have some chemical evidence and we have evidence for pollen and spores and other phyto debris that was washed from the terrestrial environment out to the offshore muds. So with all this information, we can actually begin to create a diagram of a rudimentary ecosystem structure in the ancient Cretaceous Arctic. At this environment, we had sizable trees on land that were shedding terrigenous debris into the marine environment and in that marine environment we had large populations of phytoplankton that would have been fed on by zooplankton and we also had sizable vertebrates feeding on those plankton or on planktivores in a short food chain and we had another short food chain of sizable benthic feeders that were feeding on invertebrates on the seafloor. Now we, we don't know exactly who produced, who, who, were, who was feeding on what, um, but this, this gives us a structure of that ancient ecosystem which we can then compare with the modern Arctic ecosystem.
and we can recognize two major differences in the structure of the ecosystem. In the first place, in, modern, in the modern Arctic, all of the plants tend to be very short tundra, so they shed, would shed much uh, less phyto debris into the marine ecosystem. Also, in modern uh, polar ecosystems, there is much more persistent long-term sea ice. And that would certainly block some of the sunlight and probably serve to reduce the amount of photos, uh, photosynthesis that could have occurred if that ice, if the ice hadn't blocked the sunshine. But on the other hand, one similarity between the modern ecosystem and the Cretaceous ecosystem is the presence of short food chains. In modern ecosystems, we do have very large animals, like gray whales, that feed on plankton. And sometimes these whales and other sizable vertebrates feed on benthic organisms. So these are short food chains in both the Cretaceous and in modern ecosystem. And modern ecosystems. And this does make sense because you generally tend to get short food chains in environments that are unstable. And Arctic our environments are notoriously unstable in terms of the weather. So that means organisms have to eat what they can and not depend on a very complex um, food web. We have only tapped the surface of learning about some of the ancient polar ecosystems that I and other um, scientists have told you about during this polar dino fest, but they are giving us a, a window on an ancient world that we have no modern analog for today. Thank you very much.